Welcome back to Viewpoint. I'm Jim Zogby. My next guest is Maureen Youssef. He's a South Asia advisor for the Center for Conflict Analysis and Prevention at the U.S. Institute for Peace, where he manages the Institute's Pakistan program. Former fellow, Boston University and Harvard's Kennedy School, a native of Pakistan, where his articles appear in the Friday Times newspaper. Thanks for joining us. You. Well, you wrote back uh, in August about how the U.S. and Pakistan could improve the relationship, the U.S. image in Pakistan. Uh, that was at the time when we had that, uh, what turned out to be a CIA operative who had shot a young uh, person uh, in Pakistan, and there was an uproar over it. Things have gotten much worse, uh, not better. This recent uh, attack uh, that took the lives of 24 pa uh, Pakistani soldiers on the border caused a great inflammation in the relationship. Uh, the president called and offered condolences. It was not an apology. Um, I would guess, given the nature of American politics happening right now, you, you're not going to get a, 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 an apology listening to Mitt Romney just a second ago. But uh, what, was the president's call enough uh, to do the job that needs to be done right now with, with Pakistan, or does a whole lot more need to be done? I think the fundamental point here is that neither side can break away. I still maintain that despite you know them going from crisis to crisis in the past year. Um, whatever it takes to get this relationship back needs to be done. And in that stead, I don't think just a call was enough. Uh, I think the inquiry, perhaps, if that could be fast-tracked and we find out what exactly happened, and if there's an apology due, that needs to go out. If not, then we'll know what the facts are. But at this point, the sentiment in Pakistan um, is worse and more acutely against the U.S. than I've seen uh, in the past 10 years. There's no question about that. You have here Republicans uh, watching the last debate, with the exception of Michelle Bachman, who was rather uh, right. interesting on that issue. Right. Most of them calling for cutting the aid. Um, is there a danger there? They control the House. They control the Foreign Relations Committee. Um, is there a danger that that might occur? And what would that do to the relationship? Or would it not matter, given the fact that it's largely military uh, assistance? I think it would matter. Not as much in substance as it would in terms of the symbolism. Um, the rhetoric around aid um, is so high profile. There's so much talk about aid being the moniker of this relationship uh, that if that gets cut, I think the Pakistanis will come out and say, we always knew you were going to do this. This is transactional and all the rest. Um, I don't think it's going to be cut. I think the Senate is uh, still well disposed and understands the importance. Uh, so does the House. Uh, and of course, President Obama has the veto at the end of the day. So I, I don't see any danger of that. Uh, but it's very clear that the Hill is frustrated with Pakistan, wants to see more cooperation, and is not getting it. And I don't think it will. On the Pakistani side, there have been uh, other measures taken, the uh, uh, blocking uh, shipments into a a Afghanistan uh, just for, for one. One, um, and boycotting this uh, this recent bond conference. Uh, bond conference. Um, does Pakistan have leverage in this relationship? Uh, do these does does this blockade uh, boycott? Uh, does it sort of enhance their their position in this, right. uh, or 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 is it something that's like water rolling off a duck's back? No, I think it's slippery slope, definitely. Pakistan does have leverage till Afghanistan is alive and Pakistan's need in terms of reconciliation is there. Uh, Pakistan certainly has the upper hand. On the other hand, if you keep pushing it too far as Pakistan, uh, you may start getting isolated because there will be a time when the world says, you know, enough is enough, we can't do this anymore. I don't think that point has been reached. But again, if you go back to my starting premise, which is that both need to make this work, then Pakistan, the onus on Pakistan is as much to make sure that, you know, no lines are crossed. Talk to me about the need to make it work. Um, make the case for the U.S. why the need to make it work. I think it's fairly simple. If there's anybody who believes that the reconciliation process in Afghanistan can go forward without Pakistan being on board and actually actively helping, uh, I think they're wrong. Uh, every indication has it that Pakistan has a critical role to play. After all, they are the neighbor there, they have to live there, and they will uh, have their cards to play if they think that Afghanistan is going in a direction they don't like. So there's no alternative but to work uh, through Pakistan, especially when the U.S. has decided uh, that it's going to draw down uh, by 2014. Tell me about this, uh, this terrorist attack uh, that killed uh, Shia uh, in, in, uh, in Pakistan just a few days back. 
in Afghanistan. Uh, in Afghanistan, rather. Right. The, the report, the group that claimed credit is in Afghanistan. Um, it was a, a bloody sectarian clash. Right. We just did a poll there the, in Afghanistan, and the, 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 the sectarian split is very real in the country. It's a small Shia community, I mean, right. relatively speaking, right. um, but it's still significant enough in numbers uh, to make a difference. Um, right. is, is the ISI involved in support for this group? I, I know that they are with the, the groups that operate in Kashmir, but this group as, as well? There was some confusion about this. This group is an offshoot, as far as we know at this point, of uh, a group called lashkar e jhangvi which has been a long-term uh, presence in Pakistan, a sectarian group, also active in, in Balochistan, in Pakistan, and has created all sorts of problems for, for the Pakistani state. This group is an offshoot which has gotten linked up with the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. A uh, very obscure kind of group, not much information there, but I don't see any uh, reason to believe that the ISI would have a role in uh, fueling sectarianism, uh, sectarianism sectarianism in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I doubt that. But at the same time, this is the first time that a sectarian uh, attack of this nature has taken place in Afghanistan. Given the mistrust between the two sides, it's very natural for Afghanistan to point fingers at Pakistan, but I wouldn't jump to any conclusions just yet. Okay, I want to come close to home. Uh, recent resignation of the U.S. ambassador, the, sorry, the Pakistan ambassador right. to the U.S., right. something called Memo Gate. It turns out that some former U.S. officials were involved in passing right. the memos, and right. there's a shady character involved, uh, uh, a U.S. citizen uh, a a as well. Uh, just describe in general terms what happened, what are the consequences of this, not for the individuals involved, but how does this affect the, the relationship, if at all? Look, it says something very fundamental and disturbing about the Pakistani state, which is that there is still this sense that we can go to a third party, mostly the U.S., and try and get an internal recorrection of our civil military imbalance. It's just impossible. I think the U.S. has done the right thing by saying, hands off, this is not our problem. On the relationship... What the memos were calling for were U.S. assistance in getting controlling the mil the Pakistan military essentially warding yeah. off uh, a threat of a coup but then giving all sorts of concessions to the US which I don't think any Pakistani would accept quite frankly mm -hmm. um, and so you know that tells you something troubling about the weakness of the state inherently mm -hmm. on the US side I think the answer of taking the hands off is absolutely correct uh, what we do know now is the memo w did exist, it did happen, but I don't think there's any real impact on the relationship. We've got a new nominee for the ambassador, uh, ambassadorship, she should be here soon. I think you'll get back to normal on that. If you want to get into the conversation, give us a call. If you're calling from overseas, the number is 001-202-420-5665. If you're calling from here in the U.S., it's 1-202-420-5730. Just two two more questions I, I have that uh, that in, in, intrigue me. One is about Imran Khan. Right. He was a guest on our show. Uh, other than causing uh, many of the women uh, who work here to swoon, um, he is quite a compelling. He's a star. Um, he has had a, um, a a tremendous resurgence in in in, in Pakistan, right. um, and is taking a very interesting uh, position, a very populist position. Uh, if you will. Uh, talk about a little about that and about where Imran Khan is in the constellation of future political leaders yeah. in the country. I think he is a serious player, definitely more so than people give credit for. Um, he's always been rising in popularity, but the Pakistani voter is a conservative voter. If they know that a particular party cannot win, they will not waste their vote. Uh, that myth has been broken for Imran, and I think he's going to be a contender in the next election. I don't see him sweeping the polls, as he says, but I certainly see his party doing reasonably well and, and getting a presence felt in the parliament and being sort of a kingmaker when it comes to the and next... And the issues he's raising? Well, I think all the issues are close to the hearts of Pakistani people. He's talking about corruption, he's talking about inflation, and he's taking a, a very hawkish line on the U.S., which is also populist in Pakistan. I don't think the policy he follows if he's in power will be much different uh, than most other rulers. I don't think he's fundamentally anti-U.S. He certainly has a problem with the U.S. policy. It won't be um, as cooperative, perhaps, as, as was the case previously. But he's going to be middle of the road. I don't 
don't see any fundamental changes in policy. And now there's this story that's unfolding about President Zadari on his way, or not on his way, he's in Dubai. Right. Uh, he had a heart attack, we've right. now been told. Um, and he's been put in uh, ICU. Right. They said because uh, he was getting too many visitors. Right. Right. Talk a little about number one. Uh, do we see in this something more than mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. heart attack? The rumor mill in Pakistan is that uh, this is the first step to him stepping down. Right. Talk, talk, t tell me what you think is is actually unfolding here. Look, I mean, the rumor mill in Pakistan never dies. So, you know, this, this is a great opportunity to do this. What I do know is that he was ill. He did go to Dubai for medical reasons, and he's in ICU for, for rest, presumably. I haven't heard anything which tells me this is too serious. That said, if there is another angle to this, you know, if he's the president, he's out of the country, he's got time to think, he's got time to make contacts, sure. He's in trouble at home. He's under pressure because of the memo gate scandal. And I wouldn't be surprised if he's, you know, doing a bit of politics. Is he implicated there. in the memo gate? Could be, and, uh, you know, it's not, not likely to my mind at this point, but he could be because, you know, there, there is a thought that he may have authorized that. And, and Ambassador Haqqani is out. He's back in Pakistan. Right. Uh, in trouble? Well, he's on the exit control list. He can't leave. Mm -hmm. um, I think they are now going to have an inquiry through the Parliamentary Security Committee, uh, and the Supreme Court is also hearing this. So I think this is this is good. He's getting due process. He's getting a chance to explain himself, and we'll know what the facts are. Let's go to Florida for a call. Caller? Hello? Hi. Hi, thanks your question. Yeah, thanks for taking the call. Thank you so much. I just have a question uh, about the condition of women in Pakistan. The only reason is that as you know, Saudi Arabia, which is uh, an Islamic state, uh, obviously women can't drive in Saudi Arabia, which is still mind-blowing, at least to me. I would hope it's mind-blowing to other people. But, and with the assassination of Benazir ben Bhutto, what is the condition of women, and are they able to rise up through the ranks in government? Uh, is, that, is that possible, and is it, is it, is it manifesting itself uh, through government, the women? Yeah, I think you simply can't compare Pakistan with the Middle East when it comes to this issue. Um, Pakistan is light years ahead. And that said, it is a patriarchal society. There are all sorts of problems, especially for women of the lower socioeconomic strata and rural areas. But um, in the urban areas, uh, educated women, they can very well rise through the ranks. Of course, they've had a, a prime minister who's uh, been a female. Now the foreign minister is a female. The next U.S. ambassador is going to be female. So, you know, in that sense, there is and no the taboo. the previous ambassador was a female. Correct. Uh, yeah. but there's no taboo in that sense. Yeah. Um, but I think the, the society remains patriarchal with a lot of problems uh, of gender disparity. Um, that said, I think there's no comparison with the Middle East. Let's go to California for a call. Caller? Hi. Your question. Hi. Um, our Republican candidates were asked in debate, do they consider Pakistan to be our friend and our ally? I would like to know what your guest speaker's opinion is, uh, what his answer would be to that question. Okay. Thank you. I mean, right now you see a very hawkish line coming out of some of the candidates. I, I think this is split. But what I see, quite frankly, uh, is that the next year uh, it's going to be fairly popular to bash Pakistan. That's kind of the narrative that is here. Is Pakistan really an ally? Uh, I think you've got to look at the part of the relationship you're talking about. Pakistan has done a lot for the United States in the past 10 years. I don't think it gets enough credit. It's lost 30,000 people, and not all because of the U.S., of course, but it's, it's the war on terror, it's terrorism. On the other hand, there is a fundamental disagreement on Afghanistan, and I think some of Pakistan's policies uh, could be much more helpful uh, towards the U.S. I don't see that changing because both sides are playing Machiavellian politics. And, you know, there's, there's no normative sort of space for, for doing that. So I think it's cooperation and competition at the same time. Uh, and both are very important for both countries. Is it possible that the well gets poisoned in, in the process of this debate over the next year to the point where I, I can recall in 2008, uh, no matter where I went going around the country, any Pakistan audience raised the issue of what President Obama said he would do. Right. He's now done it. Right. More drone attacks right. and the right. uh, the bin Laden assassination in Pakistan, which caused a sense of uh, violation of sovereignty, despite right. the fact that uh, you know people weren't necessarily allies of uh, of bin Laden. Uh, it, words have consequences, and I, yeah. I, I I wonder is this when you hear a debate like that last Republican debate, 
and in Pakistan, what does it do? Look, the well is already quite poisoned, and mm -hmm. poisoned to the to the point where I think both sides now accept uh, negative sort of perceptions and opinions coming out of the other side. Can it get worse? Surely it can. If it, if it gets to the point where everybody here in unison is saying we don't want a relationship with Pakistan, yeah. Pakistanis are already saying that. We're, we're done, but thank you so much for, uh, for this. It was a, a, a great uh, uh, opening, I think, to some understanding of some of the key issues between the two countries. If you want to get more information, follow us on Twitter at AAIUSA or log on to the website, AAIUSA.org. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week on Viewpoint. We're going to talk about the, the presidential elections uh, in full next week. Thanks.